Hey there, everybody. Good morning. Uh, hopefully you can see me okay, but you're not really going to see much of me myself. And uh, this has turned into a heck of a shoot. I tried this yesterday and accidentally deleted it. And I'm shooting from the car again as I did yesterday for a couple reasons. Yesterday was an incredible amount of wind. Today there is, um, uh, it's very, very cold out. Yesterday morning and this morning are very, very cold. And there's a lot of road traffic, so it's just going to drown me out. So here I go. I am at the, uh, what is basically the, um, the beginning of the battle, I, I think it's known as uh, the Battle of Seminary Ridge. It is the um, first opening battle of the war. Um, now, down the road, of course, uh, just about this time in the morning, um, around 7.30, uh, just uh, up the road, uh, that, well, uh, uh, up the street there, um, on what was Chambersburg Pike, there was uh, the first official shot, and that's where the first shot marker is, about a mile down the street um, near Marsh Creek. Um, by the way, just to give you a lay of the land, turn around real quick. You look back um, beyond that way, we have Willoughby. There's a series of ridges before you get to uh, the South Mountain Range, which you see in the background. Uh, all the way to the background is the South Mountain Range. But between that and the tree line, you have um, a couple ridges and a couple creeks. Uh, you have, um, uh, as I said, you've got the Marsh Creek and you've got Willoughby Run. Um, in between there and, and probably a couple others. Uh, sorry about the jitters. I'm shooting uh, from my phone also so I can uh, zoom for you guys. Um, <clears throat> but this is where the uh, the opening um, battle of the larger battle of Gettysburg actually took place um, or, or very near so. So uh, here we are looking at a couple generals. Uh, to the left we've got um, General, General John Buford and he was the first one here on the scene. He actually uh, also surveyed the, um, a lot of the Gettysburg battle, um, but he was, uh, like I said, the first guy here. Everybody else was pulling up the rear, so to speak, and he knew he had to bide some time. Uh, to his right on the horseback, you have General John Reynolds. And so, again, John Buford was stalling as much as he could for a couple reasons. Uh, first of all, he was waiting on Reynolds, and, and he, he knew he was probably going to be attacked by more Confederates than he could handle, uh, perhaps a lot more. So he was desperately kind of waiting for uh, Reynolds, as a lot of generals were in these situations in, in this battle and other battles, because um, he was the first one here. He also, like I said, kind of surveyed um, a lot of the battlefield south of town. So <clears throat> he uh, did a good job in scouting out the area. He knew that there was uh, some better areas of high ground that they wanted to capture first. It's just like when you're a kid and playing uh, the game uh, Capture the Flag, right? Um, or King of the Hill, or, or both. He wanted to uh, be there first, and he knew the Confederates hadn't quite gotten there yet. Um, so he was trying to buy as much time as he could. He probably knew that he was not going to beat uh, the enemy um, at this location, that that just wasn't really going to be in the cards. Um, so uh, just to show you around a little bit more, um, over here, now it's dark, it's, uh, the sun's still coming up, um, oh, let me adjust there for you, sorry, that is the McPherson Farm, um, it was owned, uh, by a congress, uh, congressman, um, uh, Edward McPherson, although, like most of these farms, he wasn't there at the time, he leased the farm out, as, uh, many other farmer, uh, farm owners, um, did in this area, he leased it out to a John Slentz, and he was the resident at the time, uh, to add, John Slentz was married to uh, Eliza Slentz or Eliza Slentz Her. Um, I can't. I'm not sure exactly if there's a, um, a hyphenate in the name, but um, Eliza Slentz Her was the daughter of uh, Frederick Her, who also lived uh, back in these woods um, or back, you know, in the area behind there, behind the tree line. And um, her father, uh, Frederick uh, Her, owned a uh, was another tavern owner, one of a couple tavern owners, right along with uh, Mr. Getty. Um, who the town was named after. So those are some of the people associated with the battle and um, and who were in this general area at the time. I'm sorry, there's uh, there's one more who I guess should be noted. Um, there's uh, John Herbst. He also owned property back there, and I'll get back to him. But he um, he owned property back behind the tree line as well. So uh, the battle was... Um, Kind of in two parts. Um, at first, Buford is, um, you know, the only one here, like I said, and he sees the Confederates coming. 
the first Confederate uh, general to come down the road, or I'm sorry, to come through the woods, really, go back over here. The first Confederate to come through the woods was uh, James J. Archer. Um, he was a Marylander, um, a native Marylander, uh, which I'm not uh, proud nor ashamed of. Um, he, I forget the small town that he came from, um, but he came from a very small town, which was right outside what is now um, uh, known as, uh, oh shoot, Harvard of Grace. Um, way at the tip, at the uh, uppermost tip of um, the Maryland Chesapeake. Uh, he was a lawyer by training, actually. He uh, went to Princeton first, and um, some people might not know this, but, um, you know, this was uh, still in the early days, kind of, of the nation. And, um, you know, Princeton, of course, and Harvard, they were a lot of the first schools. But um, a couple of the th first state schools were the University of um, Pennsylvania and the University of Maryland. So he actually uh, passed the bar at University of Maryland before he enlisted in the army and decided to become a soldier. Um, again, Maryland, of course, is a border state, so it, his loyalties could have gone either way, but he chose to side with the uh, Confederate army and take up the Confederate rebel cause. So Archer is uh, has a larger force, I believe, uh, I'm almost positive, and is uh, starting to beat back Buford pretty well. Um, Archer is being Buford back, um, through this area, through these woods. I believe at the time that they first met, they were across Willoughby Run, which would be the first creek behind these woods. Um, again, then you have Marsh Creek and some others, but I believe, uh, if I have this right, John Buford was, um, getting beaten back by J.J. Archer, um, across Willoughby Run back to the side. Well, uh, I'm sorry. Across will be run, but maybe not through the not not through the trees, not through the um not through the woods. They were still fighting in the woods, and that was around the time that uh, Buford was uh, eventually uh, relieved, well, uh, partially relieved for a little while by um by John Reynolds. John Reynolds unfortunately eventually got killed in action in those woods, and he was uh he was killed on John John Herbst's uh, property. Um, so to get to the civilians, and I don't want to make this too long, of course. Um, but to get to the civilian side of the story, John Herbst uh, miraculously was one of the only uh, uh, landowners in, in this particular battle and, and most of the Civil War. I mean, I think there, there were some others, but he was one of the only ones who uh, did not flee his home during a fight and whose home was not destroyed uh, on those both on those two counts. He got pretty lucky now. Um. Of course, the Confederates did want to destroy his home, um, and, and destruction of homes was usually not a uh, a brutal thing, but more of a, a tactical thing, okay? And I'll get back to that, and I've already kind of addressed that in other videos. But um, the uh, Confederate general who uh, finally uh, came um, upon the property and into the house um, did desire to destroy it, but did not because um, there were a couple of uh, wounded soldiers lying there on the floor. I, I think they were lying on the floor, bleeding and, and in a very bad mess, par, uh, possibly with broken bones or bones shattered by many balls. Um, <clears throat> but the Confederate uh, officer who came on, or general that came on the scene and wanted to destroy the home didn't because there were some wounded soldiers, um, uh, I believe if I have this right, uh, or at least according to the American Battlefield Trust, um, two of those soldiers were Union and uh, one was Confederate, and at least one of those soldiers being the Confederate could not be moved. Uh, now, th there could have been a couple more, I'm not sure. Um, perhaps all three could not have been moved, but I know there were at least three soldiers wounded on the floor, and um, at least one of them, the Confederate, could not have been moved um, without f uh, further you know, uh, harming him. So uh, the uh, general decided not to destroy the house. Um, the McPherson uh, property... Uh, actually survived intact. They had to flee. So again, you know, um, getting back to um, Herbst, he was one of the only ones who kept his property intact and did not flee. Um, the McPherson uh, farm, again, uh, uh, in residence by John Slunts, uh, they did have to flee, but the property, most of the property, I believe, survived somehow. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why. Um, John Slunts uh, was the first out, and, and in many of these cases, he and um, another male took the horses um, and tried to get them out of town. Um, not to be cruel uh, to his wife, not to leave her, but um, 
that was often the case because they were trying to protect their most valuable property. And uh, after their property itself, the most pr uh, valuable thing they owned, of course, was um, were, were their livestock. So he took uh, some of his best horses and tried to get away with those um, and, and to hide the horses. He did not. He was intercepted. But um, his wife, uh, again, um, Eliza uh, her, Slens, her, or Eliza Slens, um, eventually made it uh, to safety. She made it into town. She uh, made it to Baltimore Street uh, to the residence of uh, Harvey Sweeney and was um which is now known as the uh the farnsworth house and uh, and that was temporary and she made it there first and then i think like many others in the story she eventually uh took refuge in the um lutheran seminary up on seminary ridge which is uh not too far from this spot uh man it's shaping up to be a nice sunrise um so there's one other uh civilians uh story in uh, a civilian aspect in the story and that was um amelia Amelia Harmon. So the um, the Harmon house is just a bit down the street, um, and, and this is a really uh, intriguing and, and harrowing story. Amelia Harmon was um, at her residence again. the The males were not there. Um, not not to you know uh, put any value on that, but her father uh, was uh, residing, I believe, at the time in in Washington D.C. He wasn't even in Gettysburg. Uh, he was an inventor. I'm not sure what he invented, but he was in Washington at the time. Um, and I'm not sure where her uncle was at the time either. He may have also left and tried to take livestock um, away from the property uh, to hide or to relocate. But uh, at the time of this, uh, that the, all this was going on, um, Amelia Harmon was only 16 years old when uh, violence uh, uh, fell upon the land and then came right to her doorstep. Um, she, she was there uh, alone with her aunt, which had to have been the, the, the scariest thing ever. Um, I'm not sure if you guys can see me. Hopefully you can. Maybe I'll pan back around. But um, so at first, uh, the Harmon house was very briefly occupied by Union forces um, that did not last very long at all. Um, they were probably with Buford um, before they had to uh, turn around and and uh, make haste and, and start to fall back. I don't want to say retreat, but they uh, they fell back a bit at first. Um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure if that was before or after uh, Reynolds arrived. But um Union forces very briefly occupied the home and then had to uh, evacuate. So there's a little lull. But by the way, there's a lull in the fighting um, in, in uh, the, the morning of the July 1st. Um, but then uh, she's hiding in the basement after that happened uh, with her aunt. And, and they hear um, the ground start to uh, slightly tremble, um, kind of the way there is when, when there's a stampede, because there were hundreds of Confederates who were starting to come across the hill. Um, um, I'm sorry, across the field and uh, onto her property. And they uh, were in, hiding in the basement. And at first they couldn't get a really good look um, because it was, I, I think, like a window well type of window, you know, very small and, and, and didn't give you much of a view. But they could see the uh, uniforms from the um, from like the, the pant leg or from the knee down. And they could see that the uniforms were gray and that they were Confederates. And if you can imagine the, the fear that must have uh, shot through her heart, it must have been just awful. Um, the Confederates uh, entered the home and, and found them and uh, told them that they were going to burn it. Again, this was not an act of cruelty. This was, an, and not to defend uh, the Confederate troops, but this was a tactical move, um, as was often the case, as I mentioned in other videos, um, for the simple fact that they did not want it to become a possible uh, nest for sharpshooters um, should the, the tide uh, uh, turn at this particular scene in this particular battle, and should that house uh, again fall into uh, Union hands. Um, and again, the Union did the same thing in, in other cases as well. And as I've mentioned, um, and, and it, certainly in any high vantage points, uh, cupolas, you know, in churches and schools and so on, or, or, or seminaries, um, that, that weren't um, um, firmly held by one side or the other. Um, so, they have to, you know, make a, a decision, of course, do we stay? Do we try to um, change the mind? You know, do we try to sway these Confederates from not burning the house? Or do we maybe sneak back and double back and then try to put the fire out and try to salvage what we can? Or do we just do the pragmatic thing and GTFO and, and roll out? And so um, luckily that's what she did. Her and her aunt eventually had to flee the house. What was even kind of more amazing was um, their... their their route of escape was actually between two uh, quite large uh, um, 
uh, lines of, of Confederates, um, two, two battle lines of Confederates. So if you can imagine, they're, they're in total shock and horror, scared out of their, you know, out of their wits. Their house is starting to burn. They're watching all their, you know, the, their beloved possessions and property burn. And then they have to flee between two lines of Confederate troops and hope and pray that nothing worse happens to them, that they're not intercepted again, say, by a rogue, uh, some rogue troops who just decide to harass them or worse or kill them or capture them or what have you. Um, and they eventually made it to safety as well. I'm not sure exactly where she ended up, um, but uh, uh, one good guess is probably uh, there's the sun. So beautiful. Um, uh, she very well may have ended up at the uh, sorry about that at the um, seminary as well. I'm not exactly sure about that, but I know she did make it to safety because um, she gave uh, this account was one of the uh, most vivid accounts um, of the the Battle of Gettysburg in general, and um, she gave the account much much later. I'm not sure um, exactly how that came about or, or why it was so much later, but she gave an account of this um, herring. Uh, escape and, and story uh and i think in 1915 again if i have that right so uh i'm past my normal limit i am shooting with the phone and the gopro always likes to cut me off but um hopefully all this uh will stay intact and, and stay as one piece if it does not i may choose to um post the second part depending on where it gets cut off sorry about all the traffic i'm sorry i'm shooting from the car but uh once again the conditions are just not conducive to uh, getting out and walking around. Um, by the way, the credits for much of this story and much of this information, not all of it, but um, a lot of description of the battle that I've been um, catching up on comes from Andrew Dalton of the uh, American Battlefield Trust. So a lot of credit goes to him. And of course, no credit goes to him for any of my blunders if I've got any of that wrong. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm signing out of here, guys. I have got to uh, leave, head down the road. Oh, that's a big one. Wow, look at that. I've got to head down the road and go back to work, I'm afraid to say. So, until the next one, guys, we'll see ya. Uh, can't say when I'll be back. Might be next week, might be next month. We'll just see. I'm not going to make any promises this time. Ta-ta.